All right. Um, well, hi, everyone. And welcome to the, I guess, the last day of the conference. So you made it. Congrats. Uh, we are going to talk today about uh, how Spotify has used Flight to uh, revamp their financial analytics platform. And uh, my name is Haytham Abu I am uh, one of the co-founders and maintainers of the Flight open source project. And joining me today is uh, Dylan Wilder from Spotify, but uh, unfortunately, due to personal circumstances, he wasn't able to be here in person. But he uh, was gracious enough to share his thoughts in a recorded video. Right? So without further ado, I'll let him introduce himself and talk about what Spotify has been trying to do. My name is Dylan. Oops. Um, I'm an engineering manager uh, on a team called Vivaldi within Spotify. Uh, we work in the finance department. Um, and I'm also the tech lead on a project called One Model. And so that's what this is about. Um, and One Model um, is really powered by flight. I just want to give some background on what we're talking about. So this is really One Model is a financial forecasting problem. Um, and quickly, what financial forecasting is, um, is Every quarter as part of compliance objectives, uh, Spotify is required to project two years into the future what we think our profit and losses are. And that's part of just being a public company. Um, and so it's basically a projection across all of Spotify's various business processes. Uh, what revenues do we think we'll take in? What costs do we think we'll have to spend in order to get there? Um, as in addition to just being part of you know, a requirement, um, it also forms a, a big part of Spotify's business planning. Uh, you can imagine this is useful for investment investors. It's just as useful internally for the people making decisions, the C-suite, et cetera. Um, unfortunately, uh, you know, it's organically evolved over the years um, to be a bunch of different uh, heterogeneous processes across many different teams. Um, as you might imagine, Spotify is a pretty complicated company. Uh, we have a lot of different products. We work in a lot of different markets. Um, we deal with licensors, music law, stuff like that. Um, and so the expertise in order to kind of run this system is scattered across a lot of different domain experts. Um, and so as it stands, this process takes about three to four weeks every quarter, it span as many as eight different teams. Uh, these teams work in silos. Some of these pieces are Excel models. Um, and then at the end of the day, you might imagine team one is handing off a Google sheet to team two to start running, you know, if the number of subscribers we get is input to the amount of revenue we think we're going to get, team one has to hand that off to team two. Um, and so it's a complicated process. And so goal number one that we're really trying to accomplish it may be obvious, but it's an automation problem. Um, we want to fix these manual handoffs. We want to speed up the, the feedback time to do this process. Um, and we want to, you know, reduce for errors. Um, and a secondary piece of this is that because it takes so long to run, we can only really do this once per quarter. Uh, it's too much of an effort investment. Um, and so if we think by automating this, we can really unlock the second piece of the problem, which is business casing and scenario analysis. If we can run this problem end to end, you know, within a couple hours, then um, these people making the decisions can come in and say, well, what happens if we increase, you know, our subs by 20 million people in India versus what happens if we open a new market in Eastern Europe or something like that? So you can start to ask these questions more frequently. Um, without having you uh, humans in the loop in order to answer them. Uh, there we go. Um, so this is high level overview, what it looks like. There's again, it's a complicated process. Each of these nodes in this graph is actually, you know, this isn't one flight task per se. It's a bunch of different things. These are just high level logical pieces to Spotify's business model. Um, and as you can see here, each individual one of these uh, might be owned by a different team. Um, and there's lots of, you know, complex dependencies between teams. Uh, and there's no, I mean, this is our best shot at what this thing looks like. There's no like person who's in charge of like the overall end to end thing who knows exactly what this looks like. It's, it's, it's very much a distributed ownership model. Um, so yeah, one model automating all the components. Uh, 
And once we do that, we can kind of unlock this scenario, this business case and analysis scenario. Um, and, you know, we think that'll be really cool. Uh, All right. And thank you, Dylan. <laughs> Um, so I thought this, you can think of this part as, well, this is our sort of requirement gathering phase. Now we have a problem statement and uh, this is Spotify, right? Uh, you can imagine that problem replicates to a lot of other, even smaller companies that don't have the capabilities they do, uh, the infrastructure they do. Uh, and uh, I thought before I, I talk about how Flight has helped them uh, and has been used in Lyft as well, I will go just quickly through uh, how we got here. Uh, so it was not a very long time ago when that was sort of the software mantra. You develop software and ship some golden image on a CD and throw it over the wall to you know poor ops engineers who have to deploy and scale and service your application and handle incidents and all of that. Uh, and in 2009, uh, the, the, the term DevOps was coined and it sort of skyrocketed since. Uh, and the you know, coining of a term doesn't really mean we uh, finally figured it out or we solved the problem. I think it's more of a recognition that there is a problem or a set of requirements for a problem to be solved. Um, and you know, over the years, we have built quite a lot of tools right, as an industry. Uh, there are a lot more, you know, CI systems and monitoring and, you know, all of these things, um, incident management and responses, and you can see a lot of them in the showcase uh, floor uh, downstairs uh, if you've been to. Uh, and a couple of years after that, this term came to be, again, uh, another term got coined, RPA, Robotic uh, Process Automation, um, and it was more of a, the, the, the business side of you know, uh, a lot of companies looked at, you know, these, uh, the DevOps and, you know, what all the innovation that has been happening there. And they were like, well, we want some of that, uh, but their problems are a little bit different. Uh, the problem, the, the, the data they deal with and the people who need these automations are not necessarily developers who will write code for it. So they also needed slightly different set of solutions for it. Um, and I think by 2018 or something, there were like the, the most number of uh, RPA solutions out there. Uh, uh, right now, things are sort of converging. And in 2015, MLOps term was coined. So that was already six years after uh, DevOps or so. Um, and uh, again, the, these are like the, the dates don't uh, mean a whole lot, but one of the signals you can deduce from this is the, the in industry understanding or recognition of the, the difference in problems and requirements for ML uh, and data only really sort of matured uh, around that time. Uh, and, it, and since then, again, we have been developing tools and, uh, um, and processes and trying to make you know, the life of ML engineers and data scientists better. Um, I, you know, maybe b before then, I would say there, are, there were a lot of attempts to sort of force uh, some of the dev tools, DevOps tools onto ML engineers, um, and they conceptually sort of work. Uh, if you want to, you know, deploy your model, yeah, you can write a CI system for the, or the CI, use one of the existing CI tools for it. Uh, if you have, you know, multiple steps and training and pulling data, you can, you know, overimpose it into onto an existing CI tool, but you know uh, it didn't really quite work. A lot of engineers found themselves fighting with infrastructure a lot to get anything really done, um, and I, I found this sort of meme, I guess, uh, very applicable because you know if in a few months it will be exactly seven years since uh, coining that term, and it pretty much feels like an an, an hour. Apologies about that. Um, uh, an hour has passed since sort of the, the, the progression of, uh, uh, of us solving this problem. Uh, I wanted to summarize a little bit some of the, the key differences I see between the requirements uh, for you know, the DevOps and, and ML ops, data and ML ops. Uh, 
Um, and, you know, again, uh, from a 10,000 foot view, they look pretty much the same set of problems. But the, the, when you look at the details, the inputs, for example, for a data or ML pipeline, a training model might be, it's not just the code you wrote to train a model, it's also the terabytes of data you want to train the model. And when those changes, your outputs change. Um, in the dev world, you just have code and it's you know, usually in megabytes. And it's okay if you have you know, 10 or 100 different CI pipelines that just check out the code every time, right? Because it's, it's, it's cheap. You can't really do the same um, if you are running an ML job. You want to uh, maybe share as much uh, as you can the, 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 you know, the tools, the tasks, and the steps that uh, do the heavy lifting or, or query a lot of data or uh, compile a lot of data. Uh, similarly, for the actual job that runs in, in the dev world, yeah, the CI system maybe takes minutes to finish. Um, I don't know, 20 minutes if it's a bit slow and you uh, start uh, getting uh, 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 grumpy and start optimizing it. Uh, in the ML world, if you have a training job, you know, it's very normal for these to take hours, uh, even days in some cases. Uh, we have cases where uh, uh, they, they run at Lyft, uh, training, uh, building uh, the map of the world, essentially, and that gets refreshed, you know, every couple of days and takes a long time to build and a lot of regions and a lot of uh, uh, you know, slicing and dicing of the data and so on. And it's a massive amount of, uh, of information to process. So it's, it's expected that these things take time and when, you, when they start taking time, uh, you start seeing problems that you haven't experienced in, in, you know, the, in the simpler use cases. Things like machines can die, right? Like there's some fundamental issues that you just don't even think about in a typical CI system. Uh, and you can't really run, rerun things when, when you know, system failures happen. You, you need to be able to checkpoint, cache stuff, and rerun exactly from where you, uh, you know, failed last time. There are a lot of other requirements that stem from just this one change uh, in the requirements. Uh, whereas in, uh, for the iteration, for example, they, people still want pretty much the same flexibility, right? They want to make a change, want to test it locally, write unit tests, somebody else makes a change, they want to make sure their change is validated before it runs. Um, you want to be able to you know, promote things that succeed uh, to production. Uh, so you want the same semantics, you want the monitoring part, you want the incident management and alerting, all of these things you want. Um, the, the, as goals, uh, the trick is to make sure they, uh, we offer them or make them available to you in where you are, where you are writing your code or, or where you are developing your workflows. And obviously the stakeholders um, are different between the two. Um, and I want, in the next few slides, I will talk about how uh, like Flight addresses some of these concerns. It's really our take on, on the problem. Uh, Flight has been developed at Lyft. Um, we open source Flight two years ago, and since then there are tens of companies now that uh, adopted the open source Flight um, in, for for various different platforms inside companies, well, from building ML platforms on top, data M, data ops on top, uh, to just purely using Flight. There are companies that sort of resell flight or repackage flight uh, with a you know, vertical integration in certain fields um, and, uh, and, and flight would power you know, the underlying orchestration part. Uh, flight is a workflow automation platform for business critical uh, data and ML processes. It's, uh, it might sound mouthful, uh, but I, hopefully it will, uh, it will be clearer as we go on. Um, we have a ton of integrations, and I think at this point it's probably fair to say most of these are built by the community uh, more than you know, the original authors of the platform. Uh, so they were all built to be used. They were not just built to, you know, somebody's keeping count of how many integrations are on the platform. They were built uh, purposely for certain, to solve certain business use cases. Uh, and uh, we, we worked quite hard to make sure that platform is extensible through plugins, you know, safe uh, and isolated executions of these plugins. Um, and, you know, uh, so it's, it's quite easy to, uh, to expand that list as business needs arise. 
these are a list of some of the companies, and I think we just added a couple more yesterday. Uh, so there's Lyft, Spotify, Intel, and a bunch of other, uh, you know, bigger and other startups. This is our, um, and, uh, and you know, any, any product, I guess, starts with some assumptions. And this is our assumption for how we think an ML engineer, uh, you know, goes through the process of developing uh, a workflow or a pipeline or a training model or data scientist does the same. They start on the left here with some idea. So they have some, uh, you know, they want to write some business logic to try out something, maybe query some data, process data a certain way, uh, train a model, you know, things like that. Um, and they want to write it locally. They want to start up their laptop, open up the, their favorite IDE or Jupyter notebook or what have you, and just write it there. If you start asking them to, well, you can't do that, you have to go somewhere else to start writing, then things fell apart. They want to be in their favorite tools their, the, or the comfortable environment where they can pull in requirements that they have or they want the uh, um, library requirements uh, and just write their code. You want to take um, uh, you know, restrictions on which versions of libraries they can and cannot use because some other you know, person in the team is using an older version, now they cannot upgrade, you know, things like that. They just want to sit down, write the code they want to write, and test it right there. Uh, but at the same time, once they exceed the capacity or maybe of their laptop, maybe they are just running on like sample data on their laptop, and now they want to run on the full data set, they should also be able to uh, very confidently run the code that they wrote in a remote environment where they can, you know, leverage bigger and more beefier machines and, you know, larger uh, compute environments to process bigger and bigger data sets. Um, and that process should give them, should be, should guarantee to a certain degree that the code will behave exactly the same. If it worked on my machine, it should work remotely. You know, all the problems of, well, you have a mismatching requirements or mismatching versions of some dependency, like all of that should just not be a thing that they think about. Uh, once they are ready, once, you know, things start uh, shaping up, they usually connect some of these steps together. Maybe somebody else in the team wrote, um, you know, a task that queries the data that I need. I can just use it and connect a few of those and, you know, end up with a workflow. Uh, and you want to then run that in, again, a remote environment uh, reliably that can scale, that can do things like parallelize my, the steps that can be parallelized without me having to think about that too, right? I'm just running, if I'm running in, in Python, um, Python is like single threaded. Uh, I shouldn't have to do additional work to then, you know, make it a parallel, uh, uh, get into a parallel execution, optimize it this way. It should just work. Uh, you should also be able to uh, promote the successful workflows, right, or things that produce the, the artifacts uh, that you can you deem, you know, good, maybe through running other tests and so on. You should be able to promote them to production, just like we do with services. Uh, you know, you're deployed to staging environment and you're like, you know, deploy multiple versions and the version that passes all the end-to-end -end tests, integration tests, and so on, you promote that to production. It should give you the same semantics, but again, within an environment that looks familiar to them. Um, once, again, those things happen, you should be able to run uh, on schedules, right? Especially for data processing uh, pipelines, we see that very often, right? Data keeps coming in from external sensors, from, you know, uh, external sources, uh, and you want to keep processing the data uh, as they come in. So you want to trigger those pipelines on schedules or based on events, uh, and you want to monitor them, you want to get notified when things fail, alerts, and right, like all of the conven all the things we take for granted uh, as software engineers, like they need to be offered for these pipelines as well. Uh, and again, the key point here is uh, we should meet them where they are. Shouldn't ask them to like adopt the, all of these, you know, different tools uh, for to make this work. Uh, and finally, uh, as things and you have more and more workflows running in production, uh, you will start, you know, maybe seeing failures for, from schedules, uh, or maybe you want to do some introspection for. Uh, 
uh, you get some bad predictions and you want to figure out where, where did things go wrong, you should be able to introspect any execution or, or any artifact and trace it all the way back to uh, ideally even the version of the table that you know, came in that uh, caused us to produce a model that produced this bad prediction. Uh, and the platform should, the, this is where we started, like the platform should give you all of these tools as much as we can without you having to do anything. Um, this is an example of, uh, of Python code uh, annotated to be flight code. So the, there are three functions here. Uh, they are just normal Python functions. You write your logic in there. Uh, the one thing that may be not, uh, is currently optional, I guess, in Python are types. Uh, we do require types for the inputs and outputs. You can see the pay multiplier on top here. You have takes two inputs, produce one data frame. Uh, we do require you to declare those, and we think, uh, this, I know it's a, a contentious point, but my take is any production code should really be strongly typed. I know types are optional in, in Python, and, and in many cases when you prototype, you don't necessarily care about them. Uh, but if this is code that you are writing to be, you know, uh, productionized, uh, I think they should be, uh, you should declare the types. Um, and flight uses the types in various other ways we'll, we'll talk about in, uh, as, the, as we progress to ensure, uh, you know, tasks fit together and to ensure, uh, you know, caching works and so on. Uh, so once you have the, your function, right, you can run it locally, you can write unit tests, it's just a Python function. All you need to do is add this top annotation, the add task, uh, and now it becomes a task, a flight task. Now flight knows that this is a sort of an atomic um, execution unit. Uh, it knows that it can take this, plus you know, of course any other function it call, uh, and run that in separate hardware, sandbox environments. Um, it can run in parallel if it needs to. Uh, it's like a, you know, it's, it's a standalone sort of uh, uh, function or task in our uh, language. And we wrote a couple of those, and then the third one here, it's again a function, but we uh, marked this as a workflow. What, does, what that does, uh, it tells Flight that for when you execute this workflow, execute the body here, um, don't really call the tasks, right? So we, you see me calling pay multiplier and total spend. Uh, it will not really call these functions. All it will do is it will record um, uh, that you want to call these tasks this is the data flow you want to pass. The inputs that come from um, you know, the workflow are sent as inputs to this task, and the output of this task is sent to this, to, as, right? So it's, it builds up the tree or the, the graph or the DAG based on executing the code you write here. And yes, in this example, it's just a one line, but this can be arbitrarily complex. Um, and we will just execute that once. Uh, statically with no inputs to understand the graph of execution. And from that point on, uh, it, it gets transferred into our own representation of graphs. Uh, we use protobuf to represent the typing and the graphs and all of this uh, information. Uh, and it enables flight to be targeted through different SDKs. We started with Python, but Spotify contributed a Java SDK and a Scala SDK. Uh, and you, they can all interop, right? So some people write you know, like a Spark Java task to process things, uh, but then their teammates write Python tasks and Python workflows, and they call this Java task, right? So they are all completely addressable, uh, uniquely addressable, and run in complete sandbox environments. Uh, so we don't care about your um, you know, different uh, uh, requirements or uh, dependencies, versions. This is all completely isolated and containerized. Uh, in this example, everything here is going to be in one container, so you will care. But, uh, but yeah, in, in a real environment, these things could be spread over multiple GitHub repos, like it's just completely uh, independent on each other. Uh, and then lastly, uh, even after you know marking things as this, you can still 
obviously call them as Python functions because they are Python functions. Uh, so you can write, you know, you can use PyTest frameworks and like all the testing uh, you can do locally in Python. So you can add as many checks as you want uh, for, you know, uh, for anyone else who comes in and modifies this code to make sure, you know, that it behaves as you expect it to, uh, given the inputs. And uh, there are a couple of nifty features here you can uh, add on top, right? There's this on top. I added cache equals true to this one task. Uh, and this is me telling Flight that I know this task is deterministic. I know the behavior is deterministic. Uh, if I pass it, you know, one and two, it will always produce three kind of thing. Uh, and that enables Flight to automatically cache the outputs so or memoize the output uh, of this task for given inputs and outputs and given signature and so on. So if somebody else in my team or in the company calls the exactly the same task with the same version with the same inputs, I will not run it again. Flight will not run it again. It will just say, well, here's the output. Somebody else, you know, saved you the time and, and ran this. Uh, and again, all of this is tracked. So you can always go and see, well, which execution exactly produced, like ran the first time uh, for this input. And you can go there and look at the logs and all of that. So it's all tracked in the system. Once, you know, things run locally and you are happy with what you see, uh, and you want to maybe run in a remote environment with more resources, uh, we give you, you know, capabilities to define uh, or ask for more resources for given tasks. Um, maybe one task needs GPUs, the other tasks don't need that, so you don't really need to be paying uh, the cost of a GPU machine if you are running code that doesn't need GPU. So you can isolate that part into a task and just say, for this part, I need GPUs. Uh, you can also, uh, uh, the second one here, total spend, I converted this into a Spark task. All you had to do is say, well, the task config is Spark, uh, and Flight will take care of, or the Spark plugin in Flight will take care of uh, initializing or setting up a, a Spark cluster for you, uh, containerize Spark, uh, and initialize the Spark context and the connectivity and all of that, and then your function will start running and you will have that Spark context if you, you know, need it. Uh, in this case, I, it will automatically convert. We also have type transformers that will automatically convert from, you know, a Pandas data frame to a PySpark data frame. So you don't have to do anything. You just you know, take this and start running your code, uh, your Spark code right here. And you can see I still use it exactly the same way, right? I still am calling total spend in the workflow. Uh, exactly the same way, nothing changes here, but instead now it's a Spark task and you can do all the map reduce magic that Spark lets you do. And finally, at the bottom, uh, we run, we, we have this concept called launch plans. Launch plans are um, uh, uh, like an overlay on top of a workflow where you can define certain behavior for certain inputs. You can also define uh, schedules. You can say, well, run this every hour on the hour, or you know, you can have cron schedules or uh, fixed rates. You can have notifications when things fail. So you can integrate this into your uh, existing maybe uh, incident management systems and maybe Slack notifications, email notifications, all of that. Uh, it will integrate well into your existing uh, infrastructure. And uh, finally, Flight also integrates well into your existing GitOps tools, right? If you have a CI system and you want to maybe at the end of, after merging a new workflow into, you know, the GitHub repo, you want to kick off the a run of that workflow. You can, you know, use this flight CTL to cube cuttle inspired CLI um, that can do pretty much everything like the API layer in flight uh, exposes. Uh, so you can you know, create executions, register, you know, all of that. You can wait for executions, mon like uh, uh, consume or download the outputs of executions. Uh, you can do exactly the same thing with uh, flight remote, the middle here. This is a Python library that just is a wrapper on top of the, again, the API. So it lets you uh, uh, interact with our backend uh, a little bit nicely than just calling, you know, REST or gRPC endpoints. So you can script it. Yeah, we have uh, people use this in, in other uh, Jupyter notebooks uh, to, you know, script some interactions with or, or schedule some interactions with, uh, with our backend. 
also have a UI, and I wanted to show a couple of uh, screenshots. It looks very low resolution from here. Um, so on the top left here, the, once you register uh, a workflow uh, with the backend, you can see a rendering of our understanding of the execution graph. So you can tell which parts will run in parallel and which parts will have dependencies on other parts uh, and how the inputs and how the data is flowing between uh, these uh, uh, you know, execution units. On the bottom left, uh, this is the like home page of sorts for a workflow or a task. There is a histogram that shows you, uh, you know, the past few runs, uh, how long they took, and, and whether they succeeded or failed. There's a list of versions, so every every change you make to a task or a workflow is tracked as a separate version. Uh, so everything is immutable, and that that enables us to always be able to go back to the exact version of the code that produced, you know, certain artifact. And, uh, and that obviously applies to all of your you know, dependency tasks and everything else you call. Uh, on the right here is uh, a launch form. So you can launch you know, executions also from the UI. Uh, and this is you know, auto-generated. Uh, one of the uses of, uh, of the inputs, the input types we you know, ask users to add in, uh, so we can render the right like controls for for these inputs, right? If it's a, a boolean, we'll, you have a toggle. Uh, if it's a string, you get this. There's one for arrays and, and so on. And this is also pluggable. You can uh, enrich this if you have you know new input uh, types. Once you run uh, or you start an execution, you get a big graph of uh, you know what's happening, and you can see how much is being, you know, what the progress is, what tasks succeeded, what failed. Um, there, you can see there are like boxes in boxes here because this is one of the more complex graphs we have that, uh, uh, that uses uh, composition, right? So we have a workflow that's calling other workflows, that's calling other workflows, uh, and with like branching and if conditions and so on. Uh, and the UI is able to like render the nesting uh, uh, level, multiple nesting levels here. We are experimenting with a few different ways of rendering the nested graphs. That because this looks a bit more complex than you can, you know, easily uh, understand. But uh, uh, but you know, we'll, feedback is always welcome. So let us know when things go bad and as they, you know will <laughs> at some point or another. Uh, Flight also tries to pull in the logs, trust, uh, log uh, traces, uh, uh, stack traces, uh, or as much information as we can, up, bubble that up in the UI. You can get exactly the same information, obviously, from the CLI or you know, your, the, the library I showed you, the remote library. Uh, so we try to make this as actionable as possible. You know, if it's a, an image pool failure from Kubernetes, you will see that right up here. Uh, whatever the actual error is, bubbles up all the way to the top layer in the UI, and you will just see that right in front of you. Uh, and these are just some of the features I wanted to share uh, that we hear, hear quite often that you know people like using once they start using the, the platform. Um, I, it sounds like there are uh, a few people here who are more on the infrastructure side would be happy to share more details about how these things run or deployed um, afterwards. But, uh, but we'll I want to take a second and just share what Dylan heard from his own customers right within, uh, the, the, within Sp Spotify uh, about how things are going with flight. So let me go here. Really quickly, um, I thought this slide was fun. Uh, why did we pick flight? This is actually written by our data science team. So this is not from us, um, but we think it's really cool because as engineers, a lot of this might be kind of table stakes for us, but for the data scientists, being able to get in, up and running on flight and getting all of this stuff for free has been a really big win for them. And they've been really excited about it. You know, the ability to share models with each other um, and compose things easily. Out of the box parallelism, I mean, again, may not seem like the biggest deal, but for them, when you're writing Python scripts and everything runs and takes 
a certain amount of time, whereas now for free, we get parallelism across tasks. I think they think that's really cool, the caching, um, just connectivity with GCS, all of this stuff. Um, they've been really excited about it. Yep. Um, so we talked about composition. Yeah, you can call you know, workflows from one another. Um, you can share. We haven't really talked much about this, but uh, everything in the system is tracked uh, and addressable, globally addressable uh, within a deployment. Uh, and you can, uh, other people can start using your tasks and workflows. Uh, one of the teams we worked with, they, their, their infrastructure team or platform team built uh, you know, one flight project with just common tasks that everybody else uses. Things like you know query table blah with you know dates or you know things like that, uh, and parallelism as Dylan talked about it, caching we talked about, uh, and storage and yeah compile time validation that we are also very big. We feel strongly about that that most of the errors you get um, uh, should really surface uh, as early as possible. Uh, so you get you know type checks uh, uh, like does this task produce a type that can the next task can consume or not you know things like that we try to surface that as early as possible. Uh, just a couple more things. Uh, the if you have a MacBook, it might be the easiest way to just try Flight. Uh, you can brew install Flight CTL and Flight CTL Sandbox starts. Will give you a single. Container that starts up a K8, K3S cluster with all the flight components running. Uh, and you have a server, uh, you know, you can play with UI and you can run, start writing flight code and against. Uh, Start.flight.org can show you a very simple, like a lowered examples you can use. And lastly, uh, Oktoberfest, uh, it's uh, an event. Uh, happens in October for a lot of open source uh, tools to uh, to ask you know the community to contribute. Um, we have identified you know good first issues kind of thing uh, you can uh, play with. And uh, uh, Oktoberfest.flight.org is you know where you can go check out what issues are available uh, and start uh, you know contributing. And the coolest thing is you will win swags. So I know, you know, I know you had probably enough swags from uh, the conference, but you know, uh, there are swags. Who can say no to that? Uh, so go check it out, uh, and that will be all. I will be happy to take your questions now. Oh. Thank you. <laughs> yes, please. Say it again. Streaming data, do we handle streaming data? Yes. Uh, not natively, uh, but we, one, of the, one of our customers wrote uh, a Flink plugin for flight. Um, so, and it, it lets you do that, uh, but it doesn't, so, so the, I guess the question really is, uh, can, can you execute these workflows uh, in a stream, or can it consume a stream and just run the workflows, right? Um, the execution, that requires workflows to run in you know, seconds, uh, right? Very quickly, no overhead kind of situation. Um, and most of the workloads we saw run in, in uh, containers, and there's always the container startup runtime and so on. So at the moment, the answer is no. But, uh, but it is something we are thinking about how, to, how, do, how can we integrate well with streaming solutions, um, and, and how do we offer, more importantly, how do we offer you sort of a unified dev experience? Yes? Yeah, so uh, are the, to repeat the question, are the task execution environments, are they just individual containers? Uh, can they be more than one, right? Is that the question? Yes. Uh, so this this behavior is controlled by plugins. So even the single task, like I demonstrated, um, runs through a plugin, a con what we call it a pod plugin. So in, in Kubernetes world, it will run as a pod. Uh, but we have plugins that do a distributed PyTorch, right? And that starts up a couple of, uh, 
forgot what, but like sort of master nodes and, and uh, uh, like a cluster, right? And it uh, distributes the data that way and does the training. Uh, so there are different, Spark also starts driver uh, pods and some executor pods. Uh, so depending on the plugin, uh, the environment will look different. Uh, but we do take care of uh, annotating and tracking the resources created by them. So we make sure things get cleaned up. Uh, and we make sure when we have retries, uh, that's another feature I did not talk about. You can uh, declare retries on individual task level. And Flight makes sure you start from a sort of a sandbox environment where you have the data uh, separated, right? So like the next retry will not sort of uh, read uh, like corrupted data because of the previous retry, you know, things like that. Um, so we, we do a lot to make sure these start up individually, but, uh, but yeah, they can be arbitrary large uh, number of containers. Yes? The session oh. has ended, so if anyone has questions, they can come directly and see our speaker, um, but otherwise, you're welcome to go to your next session. All right. Thank you, Lindsay. Oh.